Thank you. Welcome everybody for the, this call from the week nine. So today we will discuss about personal uh, ecology and ally skills. Um, before we start, so please add your names in the roll call and add an emoji to uh, representing your current mood. There is also an icebreaker question. So what is one thing you do want to take a break uh, from a busy or study day? Uh, so please, you can answer that. So we, uh, there is some nice stuff about sleep, uh, eating, uh, time off, etc. Um, before uh, we continue with Amy, um, just a quick reminder. So we have a code of conduct. You can find the links to the code of, full code of conduct in the notes. Um, we tried, so please follow this code of conduct everywhere during this call. So it's including during the main, doing the big every when we are all together, but also including doing the breakout rooms that will happen. And if you experience or witness any unacceptable uh, behaviors or you have any concern, please uh, feel free to reach uh, to contact us so the organizers or either you, Maldika or me. Uh, you can reach us at team at openlives.org. And if it's including, if it's uh, involved one of us, please uh, reach uh, any of the individuals uh, members. Um, uh, can you also, I forgot to ask that. So for, can you edit your Zoom names uh, include now to add if you prefer for the breakout rooms to be inside the return breakout rooms or speaker, Spoken uh, disc for spoken discussions. So please add a S or a W uh, on your side of your name. Uh, the videos will be available on YouTube within the next days. So if you don't want your face to be visible during the 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 code on the on the YouTube, so turn off the videos. It's already we are recording currently. Um, and I think that's all what I have to say now. And I will ending to Amy that will start the personal ecology and self-care part of, of this call. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Berenice. Um, yeah, so talk, we're gonna, uh, let's say deviate from our open science discussion today um, to talk about a very important topic called personal ecology and self-care. So what is personal ecology and why do we talk about self-care in open life science? Um, I think that's captured very well with this quote from uh, Akaya Windwood, who used to lead the Rockwood Leadership Institute. So part of our responsibility as community leaders and members is to care for our, our being, um, understand that our well-being is intrinsically, inextricably, sorry, in connected to our well-being and so the whole mentality is that uh, self-care is not just for us, it's as much for ourselves as for the projects that we're trying to develop and grow with our community. Um, so let me share my screen at this point. Hopefully you can see my slide. So what is self-care? Um, I think we all have some sort of maybe understanding uh, of what self-care means to us. Uh, it could be, you know, your, your daily walks, if, you're, if it's possible for you to do that outside, or it could be your, you know, coffee break in the middle of the day or whatever you prefer, but generally it's what we do to take care of ourselves so that we can contribute to the work that inspires and fulfills us. There is another term in this title called personal ecology, which again is the term that is, um, uh, coined, I think, by Akaya Winwood. So this is about what we do to maintain balance, pacing, and efficiency to sustain our energy over a prolonged period of time. Um, you can imagine why that is important for the development of our open projects in our communities. Uh, personal ecology, it's important to say that it's always strategic and planned. So we can't really have a healthy community if we individually are burnt out. A burnout is, uh, can be experienced by anyone in any type of job, a career or social cultural context. No one is immune to it. A burnout is char characterized uh, in the occupational context by feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, 
increased mental distance or feelings of negativism related to a job or reduced professional uh, if, if efficacy because of stress. They do have a broad range of personal consequences if it's not addressed. So then a personal ecology plan, again, is as much for yourself as for your community. Um, and it needs to be proactive, it needs to be strategic, and it needs to be a systemic approach so that to ensure the well being of yourself and your community. You need to um, identify the most fulfilling conditions for you, you to thrive and to sustain these conditions. And the flip side of that is that you need to identify also the least fulfilling conditions that frustrate you and try to avoid them as much as possible. So these are different for everyone. Um, and in a minute, we're gonna go into a small exercise to try and help us um, reflect and identify these conditions so that we can work towards sustaining or avoiding them. So um, again, I'm just gonna quickly go through this slide and give you some examples of, of this exercise before um, asking you to do it yourself uh, during as part of this presentation and discussion. So um, we, would, we, we want to use the concept of work, word pairs. So pairs of words that can help describe your most fulfilling day at work or most unfulfilling ones. So for me personally, I put down my list so you can see. Um, my most fulfilling days at work consist of empowering exchanges, productive collaborations, and mission alignment. So these are pairs of words, as you can see. And then I reflect on my rather unfulfilling days um, at work. And I identify that they consist of mostly unclear expectations, pointless meetings, and destructive comments. So I just want you to ask you um, to quickly, well, not quickly, but in, at your own pace for the next two, sort of two or three minutes, think about the word pairs that uh, describe your most fulfilling day at work and the ones that describe your most unfulfilling ones. And then if you could just head to the Google Doc, um, there is a section on, I lost the page number, page three, I believe towards the bottom, uh, where you can share this. So just let's try and do that for two minutes or so, two or three minutes, and then we'll see um, how everyone feels. I'm just gonna mute a few people.
please keep typing. You are still reflecting. And uh, if you're done, um, you can also read other folks' word pairs and see. I see some plus ones appearing as well. Definitely agreeing to a lot of those as well. But again, it's important to remember that this is unique to each of us depending on our work and life. So there's no right or wrong answer here, definitely. It's for you. So in the in the word pairs that I that describes our most fulfilling days at work, I see um, empty in mailboxes. <laughs> this one jumps at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also uh, energizing discussions, um, space for learning, interdisciplinary collaborations, tasks that are completed, um, clear clarity in thinking. Uh, student interactions and new ideas. Sounds beautiful and wonderful. And I'm glad you find all of these things fulfilling. So of course, um, we want to find ways to, now that we've identified this, it's good to think about how we can have more of these in our work life and sustain them. Um, and on the opposite end of things, um, Overwhelmingness, so overwhelmed with activities. I see too many expectations, definitely um, frequent interruptions, excessive workloads, unresponsive collaborators, uh, admin work. <laughs> um, yeah, many altered deadlines. Mm. So Again, it's, it's something that is good to keep coming back to thinking about and seeing if you need to update this um, as you go. But of course, try to avoid as much as possible these things that make you feel unfulfilled. Um, and if you have any reflections and thoughts um, on the uh, reflection process and exercise that you just did, feel free to put it on the Google Doc as well. There's a little section below. There's a comment about collaboration and, uh, instead of competition, which is very, very true. Um, plus ones there as well. Thank you for telling, sharing this with us. Yeah, very useful to sit and try and find words to describe things. Definitely. Yeah, so it's good to it's good to um, try and. I think it's a form, I guess it's a form of self-care um, to find time to also reflect and, and put words on things. Um, let me come back to the, grab your attention to the screen for a, a bit longer. So this hopefully help you sort of get an idea of how to kickstart a personal ecology plan for yourself. Um, again, yeah, it needs a, a strategic and systemic approach. Um, and it starts with ensuring your own well-being and availability for yourself um, and for those you care about and for the work. So again, going back to that theme where self-care is not just about you, it's about, it is mainly about you, but it's also by doing, by caring about yourself, you care about those who are around you. And also once you've taken care of yourself and be, available for your work, then you can make, help make space for others. So you can also help provide those opportunity and space for people to learn and to find time to take care of themselves. So just one sort of last uh, toolkit for you to, uh, to help guide you through this process of coming up with, with a personal ecology plan. Um, there's a handout with prompts and questions for self-assessment for our personal ecology habits. Uh, the link is on the handout, but I'll bring you through what this includes in the next couple of slides as well. So um, if you open the handout later, you will see that the first 
exercise um, or reflection thought experiment, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, is called work life quadrant snapshots. So um, this is a discovery exercise to help you uh, map out sort of the boundaries between work and home. So this is burnout happens a lot uh, in a lot of cases when your work things leak into your life. And to understand how to prevent that from happening, um, you have to understand sort of what your work life looks like at the moment. So there are four quadrants, things at work that I want to keep at work, things at work that I want to bring into my life. So there are definitely things like this, like, right, like uh, kindness is something that I want to practice both at work and in my life. Um, things in my life that I want to keep outside of work, this could be your hobbies. Um, I like photography. I don't want to bring it into my work. Things in my life that I want to bring into my work. So these are the four sort of quadrants that you will be asked to map out. So after you've done that mapping um, or as you're doing that mapping, you can begin to see how your response, what your responses are showing you about your work-life balances are basically, is there a lot of stuff from your work that is going into your life that you don't necessarily want them there. Um, you can identify opportunities to bring things into your life from work and vice versa. versa. And then finally, maybe it will give you an idea of how you can set boundaries around things that you don't want to bring back and forth between work and life. Um, and then there's a second part, which is the lights and distractions snapshot. Um, so this helps you find ways to create this delightful, engaging, remote or distributed workspace that doesn't distract you from your work or engagement with colleagues. And I think that's particularly relevant uh, for some of us who maybe have been working at home um, for quite a while now um, and maybe find that particularly difficult to, to find that space, um, that workspace that, you know, doesn't, isn't distracting or, um, but at the same time doesn't leak into your life. So yeah, the lights can be things like blankets, Mine's definitely a blanket. <laughs> um, songs, music, um, pets. If you are coding, maybe you have a debugging duck. Um, <laughs> distractions could be, you know, document formats and clutters on your desk or feeling out of place and isolated. But again, this is definitely very personal. So try and map out those, think about those ways and um, yeah, try and see how you can create and an undistracted environment. And then a final bit is a compare and contrast exercise against in your own time. So compare the current state of your personal ecology and what you would desire it to be. So what is your work-life balance like right now? And then how do you know what your work-life balance is? And then think about how do you want your work-life balance to be and what would have to change for that to happen? Just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, I'm sure all of us have at some point thought about this, uh, so, uh, about self-care. Um, and if not, then today hopefully is a starting point for you to, you to, for you to get to uh, start thinking about this a bit more. If there's anything that you would like to share with the group about your self-care tips or responses to the activities today, um, please do that in the Google Doc. Um, Think about some small immediate next steps that you can take to sustain yourself, your personal ecology and your work-life balance. And it's almost always really helpful to have an accountability buddy um, who can help support you to take the step. Um, it could, doesn't need to be a person. It's mo like for me personally, I, most of the time is a person, but it could be you know, a pet or a, a, an app. Um, any of this, as long as this works for you. Um, and think also about what your accountability buddy needs to know. With that, um, I think I'm seeing some things popping up in the chat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but I hope that this has given you some starting points to begin to build a personal ecology and self-care plan that will help sustain you forward as you move on with your open life science and project development, community development journey. 
I, if you have any questions, um, please do ask them now <laughs> or any thoughts or any tips that you'd like to share. Um, you can put them in the Google Doc or in the Zoom chat as well. I see Maya said a journal to help help with self-care. Uh, if you have any journaling habits or tips um, that you would like to share as well, I would find them really useful. <laughs> um, but yeah, any tips that you'd like to share with the group would be really appreciated as well. Can I speak to the question in the open Q&A time? Definitely. Um, so I think it's a great, uh, really important point. Someone's raised that burnout is not just a personal thing, but it's also systemic. Um, which I think, yeah, it's really important because ultimately if we're existing in a system that drives us to be overworking, then you can't say, oh, this is my fault. Uh, but I think one thing that's important to note there is that no matter what, we do have control of our own actions. And it's something that we can address often a lot more easily than you can address at the systemic level. And I'm never gonna say don't address stuff at the systemic level. Let, let's, let's take the system down, down with overwork and exhaustion. But ultimately um, looking at what we can do to make things better doesn't mean that we, you know, even though there are systemic issues, I don't think it's a bad idea to figure out what you can do to improve your lot in the meantime. I don't know if anyone has anything I'd like to add to that one. <laughs> Thank you, Yo. Thank you, Maya. No, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, please do sh sh um, share personal experiences here that may be helpful for other folks. Um, I, yeah, I sometimes, like if I have to look at a big systemic issue, I get a bit, I get fatigued just thinking about it. So I think if you have the energy, do fight, do speak up against systemic um, systems that incur like that prompts bur burnouts but yeah definitely finding ways small ways that can just make your day-to-day -day sustainable um sorry Anshika do you have something to add just a mic bump Would any other, any folks have uh, comments, ideas, tips? Going back to the previous uh, section on the documents, well, it says, yours is the best face on the earth. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that was uh, the comment that I made. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for this because I was uh, at the helm of these particular things between uh, dunning kruger and uh, imposter syndromes. Uh, you know, it happens you know, quite often. And I was told that you know, according to a survey, you know, uh, post COVID times, many researchers have been into this particular phase. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Prash, could I maybe just ask you to quickly unpack what uh, Dunning-Kruger syndrome is for everyone? Yeah, yeah just imposture is, uh, I mean, it is just quite opposite to imposture. Uh, yo. So, you know, uh, many times, you know, we reflect upon uh, certain things. We feel that uh, whatever we are uh, doing uh, uh, may not may not really be uh, uh, a kind of a successful approach. But in principle, you know, we do uh, amazingly good. Sometimes uh, we feel that we, we we are doing amazingly good, but that doesn't you know uh, often often happen. You know, what we are probably doing uh, is absolutely a kind of uh, uh, a wrong uh, uh, message that we are giving to the community. So that, that may not really work you know, for uh, you know, uh, a bigger audience. So that is what we call it as you know, Dunning-Kruger syndrome. So uh, it is just quite opposite to what we uh, you know, often uh, postulate for imposture syndrome. So in imposture syndrome, you know, uh, 
we are good, but you know, our feelings would say that probably, you know, we're not really doing good. So it's quite opposite to that. And uh, the Science Magazine and uh, uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement uh, of Science, they made this particular survey uh, uh, a couple of uh, months ago. And post COVID times, uh, whopping 40% of the researchers have been juggling between these two syndromes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prash. Um, yeah, if, if we're, uh, folks, if we want to understand a bit more about this, thank you for the explanation and unpacking. Um, yeah, if we want to understand more about this, I guess we could, it's also helpful to maybe read more about it and trying to understand if we um, are, you, like, yeah, if, if we can find communities of people who feel similar to us as well in these circumstances. Um, all right, I, with that, um, please feel free to keep sharing your thoughts. And we've also included a list of further reading um, in the Google Doc as well. But for now, uh, I shall pass over to Yo. Thank you so much, Emmy, uh, and thank you everyone. I know that it can always be a bit difficult reflecting on uh, yourself and looking after yourself. I always find it difficult but useful, I guess. Uh, but we're moving on from taking care of ourselves and looking at talking about taking care of others instead here. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about ally skills. So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And I'll get myself on the right page as well. Right. Uh, I'm not going to put this in present mode right now. I'm just going to go for it. So ally skills, this is about using our societal advantages for good. And I'm going to unpack what this is, so what an ally is and what it all means in a minute. Um, but first of all, this is a really quick introduction to ally skills. So I think at least one person on this call has actually been to one of our longer ally skill workshops. So we run a three hour workshop occasionally. Um, but we are compressing this down into one hour. Uh, so there's plenty more reading that you can do around this if you wish to. Um, but we're just going to try and get a little bit uh, from what we can for the next hour. And so, like I mentioned, this isn't a complete workshop. Uh, we, we aren't giving legal advice on this. We're basically just trying to find ways to help people step up for others um, and deal with things like systemic oppression. So what we're going to be doing today, we have a short introduction. We have a little bit of a warm up session. And most of the, the time, we'll actually be dealing with a group discussion of scenarios where you can be an ally. You're still saying, what is an ally? Don't worry, that's the next thing. So we will give you some terminology about what an ally is. Um, these slides are too slow. OK, so going into some of the terminology that backs this, a privilege that is an unearned advantage that's given to, by society to some people, but not all. And we'll talk about some of the types of privileges in a minute. Oppression is when a system actually, for some reason, um, gives uh, treats people with more privileges differently to people who um, have fewer privileges and it's something that's often systemic and very hard to address because it just exists in a way that by default things happen this way some more terminology here we have target uh, so a target is someone who is affected by the oppression or might be a member of the marginalized group in question who doesn't have the privilege and an ally, which is uh, what we're going to be talking about today, about how do you be a good ally, is someone who takes conscious action against, uh, against oppression um, and steps up for people who are actually, um, who, who don't have the societal advantages. So some of the categories of privileges, some of these you will have heard of, others you may not have thought about before. Uh, it might be, for example, that you have a privilege because of your age, which is an age that you're expected to be. So um, let's say a software developer, you might be better thought of if you're young, um, if there's ageism. Um, if you are wealthy, if you have a certain height or size or shape that others uh, might not have, then you might have a privilege. Uh, and some of these are earned and some of these are transient. Uh, so it might be that in some scenarios, something is a privilege and another scenario, that same uh, category might not be a privilege, depending on the group that you're with or the people that you're speaking with, for example. 
Um, so there are a lot of these. I think we have a worksheet which actually just asks you to go through a lot of different privileges and think about the ones that maybe apply to you and or which scenarios they apply to you in. And I think one thing that we often hear from uh, when people work through this worksheet is that they didn't realize how many different types of privileges they did have. So it's, it's a nice one to just think about for a little bit. So um, the basics of ally skills, when you are, if you want to step up for someone in a scenario where something isn't uh, going right for someone who um, is a target, is to be short, simple and firm, and don't try and bring humor into this. So this isn't a place where sarcasm or jokes necessarily tend to work very well. Um, and it could end up in, in oppressing another group, for example. Um, so it's also important to practice. Um, so simple responses that you know are safe to say and that are good to say and are meaningful to say can be part of this practice so that when a scenario like this does crop up, you actually know what to say rather than realizing it three hours later when you've been stewing over it. Um, and pick your battles. So this means don't, don't go for something if it's gonna leave you in danger uh, or if it's gonna leave you really badly off, then maybe it's not the time to be picking it. Um, and so now we say, why should allies take action more than targets take action? Um, and if I was to paraphrase this, if, if let's say as um, someone was complaining about arbitrarily women in the workplace, if I spoke up, I, t I tend to look like I'm complaining or I'm whiny. Um, and as a general rule, when people speak up for themselves or for their own groups, they end up penalized for that or um, disliked because they've stood up for themselves. Whereas if someone else stands up for them, they actually, they look upon as, um, you know, being good and being, being inclusive. So if you see someone else who's being a target and you step up for them and you're not in their group, that tends to be more effective overall than um, if someone stands up for themselves. It's unfair, but I, I think we're looking at practical and realistic steps that we can take that actually make a difference rather than uh, being able to address the root cause here, unfortunately. Uh, so why should allies take action more than targets? You often have more power and influence because you are a member of the more privileged class in this case, rather than um, being a target and you're often in the majority, you're not penalized for the diversity valuing behavior, um, and you're probably not exhausted uh, from having stood up for yourself all the time or having to fight against the systemic bias in this particular case. Um, so it's, it's overall, it tends to be people value allies standing up for other people. So it's a good thing to do for yourself and for others. Next page, next page. So learning about using the right words um, can be really significant. Um, we have some more information about this later on in the scenarios, but um, like we mentioned, practicing is key and thinking about scenarios and how you'd address them is an important part of an ally skill. And some of the reasons that these, thinking about the words that you use is important is you, um, I've, see, I've seen people saying, you know, don't, don't make someone else a target by trying to deflect it from someone. Um, so don't, stand up for someone by being sexist or homophobic or any of these other things. If reflecting it to someone else doesn't make anything any better, it just means that there's another scenario where someone else has to be an ally, um, which is probably a bit counterproductive. And if that has left you feeling awkward, I have some kittens and puppies here to help you feel a little bit better. Um, oh, that kitten is very young. Look at those eyes. Okay, I could get distracted by kittens and puppies all day, so I'm gonna move on. Um, and the next terrifying thing is like, okay, I wanna stand up. I've seen someone say something they really shouldn't have, and I'm terrified that I'm gonna make a mistake and I'm gonna be in trouble as well. Um, it happens. And it's so, usually better to have done so, to have stood up, to have said what you need to say um, and screw up than it is not to say anything at all. Uh, but acknowledge that you've done something wrong. I'm sorry, I should have said, Blah. Um, you're right, I was wrong, this is how it should be, and then move on. And try not to make a big issue of it. Uh, so some do's and don'ts. Um, oh, no, this is a skip slide. <laughs> Sorry, this is where it should be in present mode. Right. I'm going to unshare now, actually. Stop share. Right, okay. So what we are going to do is we are actually going to break into some scenarios where we have um, an, an, a scenario where you have the opportunity to be an ally for someone and we're actually going to break into these groups and we're going to discuss how we would handle each of these scenarios 
So uh, looking at the number of people we have in the call, we're going to have three groups today. Um, and these are groups of between three and four people. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, think when you are in your group, um, we want to make sure that there's space for everyone to be speaking, talk about the scenario, identify what is wrong, what could be done better, and what you would do to respond to this scenario. Um, so if you look in your uh, call notes in the Ally Skills section, we have group discussions and we'll get about 15 minutes each to discuss one scenario. Um, and then when the discussion time ends, we'll rejoin the room um, and we'll talk a bit about what you've discussed. So we'll ask everyone in the group to nominate a note taker and a reporter back for each of these three groups. So there's at least two or three people. Um, oh, I think we've lost someone. Um, but this should be enough to have a note taker and a report back person for each of these. Um, and so also if you scroll down and look at your scenarios, we have two scenarios assigned for the groups to discuss. One is on a professional mailing list you belong to, a colleague who came out as trans last semester starts a discussion. In the response thread, another person repeatedly misgenders them by using the incorrect pronouns. What would you do as an ally? And then the second one, uh, the second scenario is at a meeting, a person with a moderate proficiency in English makes a suggestion, but no one picks it. Later on, another person with a high proficiency in English makes the same suggestion um, and they're given credit for it. Um, what would you do as an ally? So those are the two, two different discussions. Some groups will have one and some groups will have the other scenario to discuss and just to see what you think, what was wrong and what could be done better. Group one, who did the professional mailing list question. Can we get someone to report back what, uh, what you discussed and what, you, what your uh, suggested response would be? Hi, uh, I think I'll just go. Amazing. I, uh, actually, the situation I have uh, been in it for, I don't know, a few times. And um, and one of them is my actually with my close friend. And uh, what happens is, uh, I mean, with my concern, even if I try to, you know, like, uh, talk to him about this topic, he's actually doing it intentionally. Uh, and then because like somebody comes and talks to him about this topic, then boom, you're in the argument, that's what he wants. And uh, this is, I, I don't know, uh, this situation I have been into like a few times, not once, not twice. So there are people like this who actually want to drag you into this argument, they are doing it intentionally. And to me, uh, what I did with my course, when I, I just gave up. I'm like, I'm not even bothering because that's what he is enjoying. Uh, he wants to argue about on, on, on this topic. So um, another thing, uh, the person might not be aware, like myself. Uh, so um, like uh, it, it took like two years for me to get used to the he and she. And like, I, even when I'm talking to, like when I'm telling stories about my mother and I said like my mom and the next sentence starts with he and people were like, what, he? Uh, that's okay when you're telling a story, but uh, I remember, I, I remember that there was this uh, lady who was my, uh, my lecturer uh, with a short hair and I didn't even know the word man. And I kept calling her sir, but I didn't even know. I I I could clearly see the face when I whenever I called her sir. But it, it occurred to me later on, and uh, when somebody uh, warned me about this, there's a word ma'am for ladies. You know, it it was really uh, shameful. <laughs> Uh, that will be the bias, I guess. Yeah. There's a couple of good points to draw out there. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Mohammed. One is uh, pick your battles. 
And if you know you're never going to win and you're never going to take it forward, sometimes it's easier and you know better just to pick the battle and do something, do, do, do good where you can rather than engaging with the trolls who are trying to be offensive if it's not going to take you anywhere. Um, and the other one is yeah, being aware that people may do things unintentionally, but usually in that case, it's a, thankfully a really easy fix because you say, hey, this is this is how you should do it. And usually it's fine because they weren't aware that they might have been doing anything accidental. Um, I wonder if anyone else from the group would share what their response might be for the email thread. Uh, if you're not comfortable, then we can always put this, I uh, can put it in chat or I could just read out from the um, document. Uh, yeah, I can go. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes what happens, uh, that, the, that we need to talk to someone, uh, we need to see the time, we need to see the situations because as he just, uh, said that he wasn't aware that this could be the issue. So if I am the ally at that moment, so I would see the time. If that person is uh, at with his right headspace and and then I would go and personally will uh, would like to address the issue or like uh, in our group, like uh, it's written about email, like sometimes, uh, someone is not, someone doesn't want to talk. They are not good at talking, so, but they want to address the issue. So we can email them personally so that the issue could be resolved and we can make them understand because it's not their fault. Uh, so like that, we can uh, have a talk. I just lost connection for like a whole minute and absolutely missed everything that Mehak said, so. Uh... Um, Avika Remy, can you respond? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just going to summarize the, the whole response that has happened so far. I think one thing to note that Mohamed said that approach any situation with the understanding that people might not have meant it that way. So don't always be hostile. As an ally, choose simple responses and responses could be as simple as, oh, did you mean to use this pronoun uh, by mistake you might have added a wrong pronoun so make you're right maybe you can write this person personally an email rather than calling out publicly but it's also important to acknowledge publicly that something has happened and we would want to avoid it and in that place also as an ally choose your battle that you was just saying that if you are not the person with power you don't need to be the person writing an email. You can reach out to the responsible person writing them. Hey, can you release a statement saying that we would like to use pronoun correctly? Please correct yourself if you're not aware of it. The reason to do public uh, announcement is to make sure that there is a set tone for the culture that you want to promote in, in the mailing list that you're a part of. Uh, another thing is that if there is a code of conduct and if someone isn't willing to accept their mistake, you can always point them to code of conduct and say that this applies to our conversation on the mailing list. So I would expect that you're following that. Um, yeah, I think that covers most of the response. Anything else to add, uh, Yo, Emmy, Bernice? I think it's, yeah, I understand, you know, that like, I, I also come from a language where we don't have gendered pronouns and it is honest, it could be an honest mistake, but, and it could be sometimes uncomfortable to confront like this person um, who may be looking for an argument. So that's why the point to pick your battle, but at the same time, it's important to remember that it's also, is most likely to be, to be the most uncomfortable experience for the person who is being misgendered. Um, so if you can, if you feel comfortable, um, try to speak up for them. Okay, I think we'll move on. Although I do want to briefly comment that languages are amazing things. Um, I, I, the only other language I speak, Hebrew, I couldn't say the phrase I am eating without using uh, gender signifiers. 
<laughs> um, so it's like so highly gendered as opposed to other languages, which you don't even have he and she, which is amazing. Um, but anyway, yeah, let's move on to group two. Um, so this is a scenario where a person with a proficiency in English makes a suggestion, but no one picks on it. Uh, sorry, someone with moderate proficiency gets ignored, basically. I misphrased that. And then when someone else who has uh, higher proficiency in English repeats the same thing, uh, that people actually pay attention to it. So, um, oh, I see a comment just from Mishka saying, if you're unsure about pronouns, uh, you tend to say they. I think that's a decent practice. I think um, it's a nice safe one for in most cases. Uh, but anyway, for group two, can we have a spokesperson just report out what the issue was and what sort of things you would do about it as an ally? So I have Irene, Maya and Mishka for this group. I can probably go. I don't think we decided who's going to speak. <laughs> we only decided who's going to uh, write down the notes. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of biases, stereotypes, assumptions, in terms of English proficiency, um, we thought that the person with moderate proficiency might have less, um, uh, less knowledge. That might be a bias. Um, also, if someone has an accent, that would mean um, uh, that, that they are not proficient in English and uh, if you don't speak like a native speaker you're not able to express yourself correctly um, and in some meetings there is the idea that it uh, doesn't matter um, giving credit um, so these were kind of the biases that we identified um, and in terms of how we would respond as an ally um, <laughs> We were uh, fully non-native speaker, speakers in our group, I think. So um, we never f acted as allies because English was not, it's not our, our, our first language. So we never felt like it was our play, a place, but we thought if we were in that position um, now, <laughs> we would probably try to kind of repeat and acknowledge that the person with the less proficient English also had um, uh, had, had a very good point um, and it might be we also thought that it might be easier to be an ally in online spaces because they allow written participation and sometimes um, sometimes it's harder to speak out when um, uh, yeah probably like in terms of being concise and clear but also maybe some words that someone might not, uh, someone with less proficient English might not be able to um, pronounce very well um, and in terms of our concerns, uh, we've some of us definitely experienced like twisting someone else's words and trying to acknowledge their participation, and um, that can sometimes happen when someone has quite a fixed mindset, so they like really want a clear, uh, an ex they have an expected answer, I guess. Um, and this is not a concern, but it was something. Um, I think it wasn't a concern, someone can correct me. I think it was more like something that we really liked, the idea of having like the uh, budding ally or uh, that kind of community, because um, it, yeah, just going outside of the zone of comfort, taking baby steps feels a bit nicer with others. I think that's it, <laughs> if I miss something. Uh, my or Iran can help, maybe. That was a beautiful recap. So thank you so much, Mishka. Uh, I especially uh, like that you acknowledged that since you were all a group of uh, English as second or later languages um, speakers, but I mean, I guess that gives you the chance to at least really understand how it feels. Um, 
and I know personally if I was speaking in Hebrew just how terrified I would be and I <laughs> so it, it's it, it's a big tough one um, but I think the main thing that you mentioned was repeating and acknowledging that the original person said the thing so it might be oh yeah thanks Sam but actually you know Jessica said this earlier um, oh yeah I think Jessica suggested that it's a really great idea and actually giving more of the credit to Jessica than to the to the original to the higher proficiency English speaker um, the twisting someone else's words one um, I think that's a good and reasonable fear but I think perhaps we that's when we reflect back to the if I make a mistake acknowledge apologize correct yourself and move on um, uh, so one of those where taking the good step is important and just realizing that sometimes you may screw up but you are doing your damn best uh, Malvika, did you have anything else you want to loop in here specifically? Yeah, I just want to again emphasize that uh, as an ally, all these situations might be new for you when this happens. And that's why having a, a sort of the group that you said, Mishka, budding, uh, budding ally would be really amazing where you can actually discuss these situations before they happen. And you want to choose like super simple response as you were saying that, oh, I heard from Jessica. And I think one of the aims should be that you empower them by saying, oh, we heard it from Jessica. Jessica, can you explain yourself, right? Like giving them the space to speak rather than you becoming a savior for them, uh, which is still good. Uh, other thing is the systemic response, Mishka, I really love when you said that we can, in general, have a practice of writing and taking notes so people actually are recording and therefore their credit cannot be taken away. In the last cohort, someone mentioned them as a powerful note taker because they make sure uh, that all the things are fairly acknowledged. So if you are a note taker, just, just remember you have huge power in the system. Is this where we jump in and say Marvika is the best OLS note taker ever, ever seen? And she has all the power, clearly. <laughs> Thank you. The, yeah. the, the point you raised about the empowerment, I thought that's, uh, that's really good, kind of uh, signing them back. Thank you. Okay, um, so normally, uh, if this was a longer ally workshop, what we do is we'd cycle back and we'd do two, three, four scenarios, depending on the amount of time. So we could address a lot of different um, ideas and look at ways to handle it. And also going back to the practice so that we know what you can say and what is reasonable to say and maybe things that you wouldn't want to say. Um, given that we have up to 10 minutes left in the session, I don't think there's time for us to find another scenario. Um, I would suggest if we have any other questions um, around what we've done so far or anything that made you uncomfortable or worried or that you've been wondering, now is a great time to ask this. Um, and also towards this nearly last page, if you want to type these questions in the open Q&A time, then there's room to put those here. Uh, I will mute for a moment and give it for one a chance if they wish to. It doesn't have to be a question, it can also be a comment. Uh, watching those hovering curses, waiting to see and worrying that I'm making the curses nervous by looking at them. <laughs> I wonder um, if it's a good chance for us to let you all know that we will probably host one longer version of Ally Skills in June or end of May. We haven't decided the date. Uh, so if you're interested, keep an eye on Slack. It's a three hour session, meaning that we really go deeper into understanding Ally Skill. And if you think that, oh, yeah, I've had enough of a life skill, but I want my boss to attend it, it would be even perfect chance to actually uh, recommend your boss or supervisor or someone in your community who needs 
a little bit of nudging to attend these workshops. With um, a note, thank you, Malvika, but with the note that with these, the LA um, skill sessions that we do, they're open to OLS participants for free, but we do charge uh, non-OLS members to um, raise a little bit of money for OLS or in some cases for charity as well. So um, yeah, we will share more info with the community when those, those are, uh, what's the word, online? There we go, tired, self-care, nap next. <laughs> I think we should wrap up. Um, if anyone wants to ask any more questions, um, like anyone ask any of us privately, um, Malvika and Emmy and I, we all are trained in the Ally Skills. Um, we, we have gone through um, specific um, Ally, Ally Skills instructor training and we're very happy to answer questions individually um, or discuss things in Slack. Um, but yeah, Malvika, if you want to wrap. Yeah. Thank you for joining. Uh, these are optional uh, calls, but it, I think in my opinion, we should not forget in our work that all the work we do are human centered and therefore these skills are a lot more stronger and are transferable across multiple projects. Um, if you are struggling with your assignments, that's uh, please don't struggle in the sense that you are not supposed to finish everything. We are still in the middle of the program. You still have about seven weeks to go. Um, we have a mid cohort survey. I hope you responded to that. We have the dead, I think the deadline for sending us survey response is 15th of April. And the reason for us to make sure that you are all on the right track and that you are paired with the right mentor and you have the expert support that you can make use of. Uh, with that, I don't think we have any assignments for this week. Um, yeah, thank you for joining once again. You're uh, free to go. <laughs> thanks all. It's been a very lovely and somewhat vulnerable day. So thanks for coming along. <laughs>